Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our fourth webinar in our series, Communicating Climate Change as a Public Health Issue. My name is Kathleen Carley. I'm uh, with the County of San Luis Obispo. We're thrilled to have you all join us. We've actually had over 500 people register for our series. Um, but yesterday we did some diagnostics and we've had over 1,500 unique views on our website, um, which uh, is very impressive. Uh, what that means to me is that there's a lot of interest in this topic um, and there's a lot of people out there that want this information. Um, we have had a slight delay in getting webinar number two and number three posted on our website. They will be posted by the end of today, we promise. Um, and uh, we're hopeful to have number four posted um, by the end of the day tomorrow. So keep checking back. Um, it will be there along with supplementary materials. Um, as in previous webinars, um, everyone will remain on mute. Uh, we will allow for a Q&A session at the end of each of our speakers today. Um, and um, we will try and get to everyone's question. Um, if there are questions that we don't get to and they're significant, we will try and get answers and email them to you. Um, but we're gonna try and get to everything before we end today. Um, with that, um, I'm, we're gonna start with our first speaker. Um, our topic today is innovative curricula for public health priority populations. Um, and our first speaker is Nancy Villasenor. Uh, Nancy Villasenor is with the California Department of Public Health. She has a Bachelor in Communication Science and a Master in Instructional Science and Technology. For the last nine years, she's been working as a health educator for the California Department of Public Health in the Environmental Health Investigations Branch. Nancy is part of the Bay Area Promotoris Committee and is passionate passionate about increasing literacy. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Um, I work as a health educator for the California Department of Public Health, um, but I uh, wanted to um, add a disclaimer that this curriculum I developed as part of my custom project for a Master of Instructional Science and Technology that I did at the California State Monterey Bay University. And it is an independent university project, not a project of the California Department of Public Health. It is currently under review and it is awaiting approval so um, we can offer it as a resource. Um, I am not going to be preaching to the choir. I do know that for all of you, climate change is an important issue. And you understand that although it is, um, affecting everybody, it affects some more than others. Um, children, the elderly, um, the destitute, um, those that are already burdened and disproportionately affected by other issues. And um, these I identified as a problem. Um, most communities, communities don't know what climate change is, its impact and implications, or the actions they can take to address it. Um, the problem is that there is not enough information for these communities and the little information that exists is not accessible or is impractical. Um, and the people that can train them or whom they trust um, don't have it either. And I'm talking about immigrants, people of color, um, and those that are vulnerable. So um, these uh, I identified as a problem and the lack of practical information in um, languages that these uh, communities need. So uh, my proposed solution was um, to develop a climate change training resources uh, for influential, influential messengers to train others. And the question is, who are the influential messengers that can train others? Well, according to the Connecting on Climate Change, a guide to effective climate change for communication, an ideal messenger is someone whose identities, values, um, 
are similar to the audience they are trying to reach. Somebody that the audience trusts and respects and uh, with whom the audience identifies. Um, now pay attention to these traits or these skills because community health workers, according to the California Association of Community Health Workers, describes community health workers, also called promotores, as somebody who are trusted community members and somebody that shares the ethnicity, language, and status and experiences as of the community they serve. Now, um, when I say community health workers and promotores, I say that, um, but they are known by many titles. They are known as health educators, navigators, organizers, community leaders, but they essentially have the same unifying factors. They are um, committed to the well being of their community, and they most importantly have that community's trust. They're the person, and in other countries, they're, they're known as by other names, but they are the person that the community goes to for answers or to help them solve a problem. They know the system and they care. And for me, those would be the ideal messengers. And I focused on community health workers for the design of this training. What I did um, is that I created two climate change training websites uh, in English and Spanish that included information on what is climate change, uh, how does it affect us, uh, what can we do to reduce it or mitigate it, and how to adapt to the current and future impacts. Um, and also I included resources so that the audience could teach others. And this I did, um, by analyzing, designing, developing, implementing, and evaluating um, this training. I worked with subject matter experts on climate change, and I also worked with audience representatives, with community health workers from different parts of California. I focused on California, and even more so for, for this um, project, I focused on Richmond, on the city of Richmond. But these training materials, can be adapted to any other communities. When I asked them, I was doing the analysis, I asked them um, what did they want, what format, what technology, and I offered an online course, a website, a webinar, instructional videos, a workshop, text messages. I offered just different ideas of technologies we could use for the training. And the audience representatives wanted the works. They said, we want everything except for the online course. Um, they um, didn't think that uh, the promotores or the community health workers that they would work with um, would be interested in something like that because they were not too familiar with online courses. So they wanted something that would be very practical. Um, the subject matter experts said that um, they wanted to stress the importance of making um, any information and education on climate change as practical as possible and relatable also. And um, they wanted to have a balance between mitigation ideas with an emphasis um, uh, on ideas that were more effective um, and realistic for the communities. We were not going to be talking about changing to solar panels um, or buying an electric car. Um, they wanted us to make it um, very practical, which is what the uh, audience representatives asked us to do with the training. They said that it should be relevant for them. It should be uh, focused on the issues that they were going to be or that they were affected by at the moment. And that it needed to be in English and Spanish. That was very important. And, and that we needed to have the training designed in such a way that they could share it with others. So it should be granular, what we call granular, meaning that uh, videos should be short, uh, more than one, um, in English and Spanish with closed captions. Um, they also wanted resources uh, that were very particular to their um, city and ideas for how to share the information. So I ended up creating um, 
uh, two websites, one in English, one in Spanish, as I mentioned. And this website has uh, four instructional videos um, that talk about what is climate change. Another one says, how does it affect us, um, meaning its impact. The third one um, is on how can we reduce its effects, and that's mitigation. And the fourth one, how do we adapt to the effects we are already seeing, and that's um, on adaptation. Um, it has a page, on, a page on resources. I'm going to show it to you, but I also wanted to mention that I did some resources. So this is the, the website. Um, it is available, available in Spanish, and I am going to um, share the website with you. Every um, every one of the four pages has a video. They are also available on YouTube. They requested um, that it would be available on YouTube so that they would be able to um, share them. Um, the training consisted on the four videos. At the beginning, I asked them to watch them at their um, in their homes at their own pace. Um, and what I found is that everybody was accessing these videos through their cell phones. And it didn't work to do it that way. Um, when they would come to the workshop, because we did have, this training has a workshop, workshop component. It is a two hour workshop that it's very uh, engaging. They um, would wait until the workshop to view the videos. And so what we are doing now, and what I am advising others who are doing this training now, is to um, have the participants watch the videos in the, in the workshop. And all the information on the videos, it is in, in text, in the form of text in the website, so those that want to read can read it do not have to watch the videos even if they don't have sound or if they don't if they don't like that and if they just prefer they can just watch the video and they'll get all the information that it's in writing um, as i mentioned they wanted resources uh, for um, the things that are mentioned in the instructional videos for example how to um, learn what California is doing about climate change. Um, it has a calculator for um, how to calculate your carbon footprint, which is one of the things they, they learn about. Um, how to get rebates. It, it's very practical, and I'm going to show you just one video on um, mitigation. And as I mentioned, uh, it is under review, so some of this information may not be um, up to date or accurate. Oh, before I share it, I think I have to do a new share. And Can you hear that? What happened? We can't hear it. Um, we, we're getting a message saying an error occurred. I'm getting that too. <laughs>
Can you hear that? No. So perhaps what we should do is maybe just uh, referring people to the website and letting them play it on their own because I don't think this is going to work. Let's do that. Then um, I'll give you the, the website address and the idea or the videos it's that they are, um, if, you can, if you can see, you maybe won't be able to hear it, but um, it, it is in English and Spanish and it has closed captions and it talks about very practical ideas of things they can do to mitigate, ideas that they have found, the participants have found uh, very doable, how to, um, and like I said, the text is on, on the website. So it talks about buying, reducing energy consumption and water consumption, very practical ideas, buying local products, walking instead of using public transportation or the, or using public transportation in the bicycle instead of the car or carpooling, um, eating less meat and sharing, reducing the use of plastics, cooking at home, limiting food waste, and for those that can, changing to renewable energy. Um, and these tips that, that, that we give them for uh, mitigation are also mirrored in the tips that were given for adaptation, uh, which talks about preparing for the impact that we are seeing in California. And I focused on the impact that we'll see in Richmond, which is by the bay, a city by the bay. And so sea level rise is one of them. Um, but um, high temperatures, air pollution, um, vector-borne diseases, um, and extreme weather events and drought are um, to be expected for us. So I focused on that. When uh, this training has been given in other places, I know that some promotoras and community health workers are already doing them in Central Valley. They focus on other issues that are very particular to their geographic area. I wanted to point you to the resources section of the website that um, has the links to uh, some resources, but at the bottom, it has um, some materials for uh, participants. They can print a list of tips and it, it is just a um, summary of all the practical information that was given during the, the training. Um, but I also wanted to show you the facilitator guide that I created for them. It is both also in English and Spanish, and it is for how to use the training, how to create the agenda. It has the, um, an overview and a suggested agenda. Um, some logistics. It's a step-by-step -step broken down by minutes uh, for um, what they would need to do to do the training. This um, training has been done in Richmond and in Fresno uh, by me, but now the, some of the community health workers that attended the training are doing this training in their own community. And I know of seven of them who have already done them. So. It is very practical. It can be used by community health workers um, as a whole, meaning that they can show the instructional videos and then do the workshop or they can then do, some of them had done presentations, informal presentations to their neighbors uh, in their living room. So it, it can be used in many ways. In that website, um, you'll also find on the resources, a PowerPoint presentation with notes for the presenter for um, talking about the concepts uh, in the videos as a review. So um, I invite you to uh, access it. It's in English, it is climate change training that we believe that come. And in Spanish is uh, cambio climatico entrenamiento that we believe that come. 
Um, can we repeat that? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm coughing. Can we repeat that, please? So it's climate change training at Weebly. At Weebly. Weebly. Yes. Weebly. W e e b l y dot com. Yes. Okay. So um, we did have a question about that. So hopefully uh, that answers your question. Um, thank you. Are you finished, Nancy? Do we have any other quick questions before we move on? Doesn't look like it. Um, Um, we did have another question that asked about, uh, again, posting from the last webinar. We will be, um, we will, by the end of the day today, we will post the webinar uh, that was last week and the third week, and we will post all of the PowerPoints that we have. We may not have all of them yet, but we'll post all of them that we have. Um, we had another question for you, Nancy. Um, it says, uh, how many people have gone through the training? Do you know how many promotoras have gone through the training? Of the ones that I've done, about yeah, 70, the ones you've done. 70 in total. And the ones that they have done now, the ones that have gone through the training, through the, some of the training trainees, um, about 50. Okay, great. Um, and then another question, how did you create the website? Was it sponsored? Did it cost money? It didn't cost any money. I did it through Weebly. Weebly, okay. Um, and I think we've answered everything else, right? So far. Okay. So we're going to move on. Thank you, Nancy. If you'd stay on the line, there may be some more questions when we get to the end. That would be great. Sure. So um, I'm actually up next. Um, my name is Kathleen Carley, and um, we are going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about a project we did in San Luis Obispo called Outside In Slow, and um, we're waiting to get it up on the website. There it is. So, um, uh, Outside In Slow, We Take Health and Climate Change Personally was a project that we did in collaboration with the California Department of Public Health. It was actually a pilot project. Our goal was to see if we could do it within our county and then to uh, see if other counties were interested. And after uh, we speak, we've got two other counties that have taken the idea and are modifying it for their own county. Uh, the campaign goals were pretty basic, raise awareness about the connection between climate change and health, promote actions that reduce climate change and improve health, and then train staff. You know, we always put that fourth bullet point on there because we really didn't have any money to do this project. Um, and I always joke that that's why they ask us to do it because we were willing to do it without any money um, but it was a great project and we're extremely proud of it. Um, our campaign style was we really wanted a win-win framing, focusing on the co-benefits. The division I manage is health promotion. We felt it was a perfect division to place the project in because we're already doing health promotion, uh, health education in the community. You know, teaching people to ride their bike, eat healthy, eat local, etc. Um, and, and so we felt it would be relatively easy to connect it to the work we were already doing. Uh, we wanted it to be emotionally compelling, action-oriented, positive, and of course, locally relevant. Um, we started actually in February 2014, and we got some partners together, um, uh, community partners, our nonprofit agencies. We had some public health staff. Um, and the California Department of Public Health came down with some marketing people and we developed a logo and tagline and an evaluation plan and by August 2014 we were ready for our kickoff meeting. 
Uh, we developed a bunch, of, a bunch of materials, and those materials are already on our website. You can go take a look at them. Um, and we had a brochure, we had four one-pagers, we had some stickers, some window decals, and we had some promotional giveaways. You know, we're, we're sitting here laughing about our promotional giveaways because we bought these, you know, um, energy-efficient light bulbs, and we've still got more than we know what to do with. Um, but anyway, if you guys want some light bulbs, let me know. So um, the campaign uh, went on for about a year and a half, but really we're still doing it. We still get calls to go out in the community. Uh, we don't have any dedicated staff members working on this right now, um, but it is still part of who we are. Um, we still promote it whenever we can. Um, during the time of the active campaign, we did over 20 presentations and we basically trained most of our public health department as well as community groups. Wherever we could find a community group that was willing to hear us, we did it. We got into several faith communities, uh, we got into several nonprofit organizations, uh, several collaborations and coalitions in the community. We did outreach booths at Farmers Market. We had a lot of media coverage, uh, several articles in local paper. We had um, over 2,000 PSAs. And again, we've got three different PSAs, 30-second PSAs that we developed. And we're gonna try and post those on our website today too. Um, you, you're welcome to modify them if you're interested. We tried to do several social media posts every week. We didn't quite get a couple every week, but we got a lot of social media posts and we were able to track uh, the impact of our social media posts. The most, probably the most innovative part uh, of our project was a WIC curriculum, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. But overall, when we evaluated what we did, it was a very successful project, especially considering that we didn't have any money to do this. Our Congresswoman, um, who was, uh, she's out of office now, she was a huge climate change advocate, heard about what we were doing and specifically came to the health department to meet with us um, and tell us how impressed she was um, and hear about everything that we were doing and we considered that a big success. It got a news story on our local television channel. The other thing we felt was very important, the San Luis Obispo County, those of you that don't know us, we're an agricultural community on the coast. We have a population of 280,000 and we have a very strong ag community with a lot of roots going back hundreds of years. We understood that the ag community tends to be uh, more conservative. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to meld our campaign with um, a, a large agricultural event. And um, our partners at CDPH were able to secure uh, the California Department of Agriculture, Karen Ross, who came down to a large event at Cal Poly, and she spoke on health, climate change, and resilient food systems. Um, it was a huge success. Again, it got a lot of press, um, and she was able to tie in the importance of climate change to the ag community. A lot of our farmers and ranchers, uh, we were in one of the communities in extreme drought. They already knew we were dealing with unusual weather and uh, she was able to tie everything up nicely in a, a nice bow. And we were extremely fortunate to have her come down and talk to us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Morgan Feld. Morgan Feld is a health education specialist in our division. We hired her as a, um, a student intern when she was working on her master's degree in kinesiology. And uh, you can share the same PowerPoint. Um, and so Morgan was responsible for all of the, um, go back to the same slide we were at, Stephen. Morgan was responsible for social media posts, trying to tie all the different pieces together, trying to keep everybody organized. She did such a wonderful job. At the end of her internship, we had a vacancy and we hired her full time. 
And now, unfortunately, uh, this is Morgan's second to last day. She's going to be moving to Bend, Oregon, where she's uh, going to be a health communication specialist. And she's going to continue to work on climate change part time in her new job. Thank you for that. Uh, this is Morgan. So I'm going to talk about the WIC program and our climate and health class. So in fall 2014, our health promotion staff and WIC staff began a collaboration to develop about a 20 minute curriculum for WIC clients. I'll get into the content of the class, but first I wanted to give you a picture of the scope. So the program ran initially from December 2014 to January 2015. And then we decided to do a revised version again in summer of 2016. And in total, we reached about 2,000 families in our community. So for the class itself, we found that using a flip chart was a great fit. It allowed for consistency between the classes and gave the WIC staff a script to follow. So we didn't expect anyone to be a subject matter expert, but we wanted them to be able to have an informed conversation with clients. The lesson itself began with a discussion of climate versus weather. We found it was really important to differentiate the difference between the climate and our weather systems, which brought us into how the climate is changing. And then, of course, how it's impacting Slow County. So we wanted to be specific and, as Kathleen said, locally relevant. And then we brought that into their family's health and then what they can do. So we gave them some suggested actions. And when we got to this point, we allowed the clients to have some input in the conversation. So they worked with WIC staff to talk about what they were most interested. And so we heard about some of these from Nancy, and I want to highlight the ones that were most valuable from our clients and the feedback that we got from our WIC staff. So one of our WIC staff members created a infograph on the cost of bottled water versus tap water versus using a Brita. And we found that was really important in, in the conversation of drinking water and moving people away from single use bottles. We also in that conversation found that one of the major concerns was the safety of drinking water. So we began to include in our class information on where to find reports on the safety of drinking water. We also included information on how to identify local produce at the grocery store and PG&E programs for energy use reductions for people who are renting. Now, uh-oh, trying to advance to the next slide. One moment. Space bar. Okay, so now for evaluation. We used a pre and post test, which tested for knowledge and intention to change behavior. So we collected data from over 400 clients, and I will get into some of our results. So here you can see the pre and post test change in intention to change behavior. We found significance in all four questions, and we do have some more information on our questions and what the survey formats look like on our website as well. So our evaluations both years showed that intention to change behavior increased following the class. We also didn't find any significant difference between the languages. So the class was offered in English and Spanish and in both group and individual class formats. So we did not find any differences between those. We did, however, learn a very valuable lesson, which you think as people working in climate change, we would know, and that was that we needed to minimize the amount of paper that we were asking our WIC staff to use. So in the evaluations, we found that we were asking clients to fill out too many different pieces of paper for pre and post tests. So while we were reaching about 2,000 families, we received about 400 evaluation responses. So that is, absolutely an area for improvement and something to consider if you're moving forward on this in your county. So we do have all of the curriculum resources available on our website. And you'll be able to find that right where you find all of the other slides from these presentations. So now over the course of the campaign, some of the most valuable lessons we learned included recognizing uh, that climate change as a health issue was new to the public as well as to our staff. So as Kathleen mentioned, one of our biggest successes was being able to educate our public health staff and 
get them prepared to have conversations with the public because as you know, a small department, we weren't able to reach everyone in the county, but as an entire health agency, being able to broaden that conversation was extremely important. We also found that people were overwhelmingly receptive and willing to engage. We of course had the, the few conversations that weren't, but for the most part, people were very positive. And we think that is largely due to the co-benefit framing that we used. On the challenges side, we found that one of the most common issues we ran into was identifying ways to move from education to actionable engagement. We would be able to get people excited and they recognize the issue, but finding ways for them to take action outside of their own homes, you know, for, from a business standpoint, was more difficult. And of course, we all know the need for additional resources, uh, particularly money and staff time is an ongoing issue. And if you have specific questions, you can also contact Kathleen via this information. Thank you, Morgan. Let's see if we have any questions up there. Okay, we'll stop sharing. And yes, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, oh, somebody said, Nancy, if you're still on the line, can you um, unmute Nancy? Sure. Sorry, but climate change training weebly.com does not come up. Need the specific URL or spelling? Climate change training .weebly.com. Climate change training .weebly .com. Try that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, tr uh, that's Kathy Koblick. Try that and uh, get back to me if it doesn't work. Um, we had several, how did you spell the website again? What are some of the ethnicities interested in climate change communication? Um, I'm not sure um, uh, who, who's that too. Uh, in San Luis Obispo County, in our WIC program, San Luis Obispo County is about 80% um, uh, white and about 20% Hispanic. We don't have a large um, uh, uh, other ethnicities in, in our county. Nancy, did you have other ethnicities in your um, curriculum when you used it? Well, I wanted to point out to um, that national survey after national survey, Latinos are the ones that believe climate change is an issue and want to do something about it. And um, when I was doing the uh, audience analysis, I found that that happens to be true. And I know that uh, the public health department did um, some outreach before and also uh, some, some focus groups to find out uh, who would be ready for um, some outreach and it was uh, it was true latinos are so california as you know um has a very uh, big population of latino communities so i would say that uh, materials that we develop need to be in both english and spanish and that as we have resources we should translate to other languages as possible i don't think that it is because people are not interested. I think that the materials are not there. Thank you, I would agree with that. We've had a couple questions on the PowerPoints and Heal Slow, et cetera. Morgan just posted the Heal Slow website where you will find all of our materials. Um, so if you look into the chat function, you should be able to just click the link and get to where our materials are posted. Uh, they're not actually posted on Slow Public Health. They're posted on HealSlow.com. And again, look in the chat function. You should have all the information. Another question was, was the flip chart pre-printed or did the training manual inc include instructions on what to write on the flip chart? Our staff, because WIC staff is very busy, our staff developed the, the flip charts. We did get everything pre-printed. We got everything laminated. Um, it was double-sided, so um, keep in mind when we did our curriculum in WIC, we had both a group class and we had individual contacts as well. 
And um, so for the individual contacts, the, the client would be sitting in front of the WIC staff member. The client would be looking at a graphic or a picture of some kind. On the other side of the flip chart would be the, the, um, the words of what the um, staff member should be saying. So we made it as simple as possible uh, that we could for the, um, the staff member. We have shared that before with other people interested in implementing in WIC. We'd be glad to share it again. Again, just contact me and we'll be glad to send it to you. Uh, another question, how did we train the staff? We had, um, we had uh, several versions of a training curriculum. The longest one was about an hour long, and all of our nursing staff attended the hour long, our emergency preparedness, our environmental health. Most, for our staff, most of them got the hour curriculum, and then we cut it down based on our audience and how much time they had. So um, it was a group meeting. Uh, it was a, a nursing staff meeting, for example, with the nurses. And they get together every quarter. And I had an hour on their agenda where um, I did the climate change training. Um, it's uh, another question from Kathy Durbin, who was actually our partner on this. What sector would you say was the most receptive to outside inflow? What city county partners did you work with? <laughs> so we worked with our air pollution control district. We worked with our metropolitan planning organization. We worked with several large nonprofits with the community foundation. With Cal Poly, we had a retired county supervisor on our advisory committee. We had, uh, Morgan, can you think of anyone else? Oh, we had our bike coalition. Uh, we had, um, you know, I don't think university, Cal Poly University. It was a pretty broad group of people. CAPSLO is our community um, uh, community action commission. They were a partner. Um, so we had a, a, a pretty diverse group in that original group that came together and, um, you know, helped us develop the logo and the tagline. Um, you know, I... Everywhere we went, I, I, I don't know if there's a group that was not receptive. I can tell you the worst experience I had um, was um, I had a staff member <clears throat> that sent out um, press packets to local media. Um, and as a result, I went on our local uh, public radio station and uh, actually went a couple times. And it was great. But then another radio station called me and I don't listen to radio. I don't know who this guy was. And um, it was an extremely conservative radio station um, that plays Rush Limbaugh. And I should have done my homework a little better and the guy slaughtered me. Um, but other than that, <laughs> you know, everybody was very, very receptive. Um, how was the message received among the ag community? It was received very well. Um, I, I think the fact that the Secretary of Agriculture was giving the message um, really carried um, the issue for us. And we did not get any negative comments. Um, it was just everybody was extremely grateful. Um, what would you recommend to overcome the challenge from education to engagement? Well, the issue was, you know, we offered the same things that Nancy talked about, you know, um, ride your bike, you know, buy local, um, you know, change your light bulbs, et cetera. And, and many people felt that was too easy. They wanted something that was more challenging for them. And <clears throat> when we would mention, um, you know, uh, going and speaking before a board or a city council, that became a little scary. So what, what I think we could have done, and um, it would be a great project for us to work on in the future, would be to take a group of promotoras or a group of WIC clients, for example, and do some training on how they could speak before a public body and how they could express their desire to, um, you know, to have more climate-friendly policies enacted by their jurisdiction. 
Um, but, you know, it, it's really that some things seem, seem too simple and some things seem too difficult. And what we've got to do is try and bridge that. And that is an area that we could work on in the future. And we've thought about it a lot. Um, and was there a great deal of grieving among the audiences? How, you know, um, I, I don't think there was grieving. Um, I, I think a lot of the families we worked in, um, particularly in our WIC program, um, you know, it, it was in the middle of this horrible drought and many of them had relatives in the Central Valley. Um, many of their relatives didn't have running water in their homes and their families, you know, 19,000 farm workers were laid off in the middle of this horrendous drought in the Central Valley. Many of them knew something was going on. I, I, I think what we taught them was, um, you know, maybe we put the why to what was happening. So I, I don't think it was grieving. I think it was like a light bulb went off and there was understanding. Um, did we offer anything specific to help lower income individuals attend such as daycare vouchers? No, the reason we use the WIC clinics was because they had to come in and get their vouchers anyway. So, uh, you know, one of the things we've learned as a public health department that the easiest way to get to the clients we want to reach is to go to where they're already meeting. And, and so that's why WIC seemed like such a perfect location because people were already coming in to get their WIC voucher. And um, people are required to attend a certain number of either individual or group contacts. Um, in the course of a year. So this counted as one of their group contacts. And by the way, our WIC program did get permission from State WIC to do this. And State WIC has been very, um, very interested in what we did. And we've had other WIC programs from around the country contact us um, because we were able to tie it into local food and eating better and, and drinking water. And, and it met all the criteria for a WIC contact. So that's why we used WIC clinics. Um, and then Nancy, sorry, this is a, a question for you. Uh, what survey are you referencing that says Latinos are most concerned about climate change? I've heard this survey referenced before in other forums. Could you answer that? <clears throat> She's unmuted. Nancy? Nancy might have stepped away, so we'll try and get her to answer that at the end. And then there's one more. It talks about food policy council, councils, power, powerful agents for change. Are, is there a food policy council in San Luis Obispo County? Um, yes, there is. We have a food system coalition. We work closely with them with our Heal Slow group. Many of the people in the Heal Slow group are also on the Food Policy Council. They were extremely supportive. Um, they were uh, part of the people that uh, worked with us and were able to promote our message. Um, and now we get another message say the web link is still not working. The I'm not Weebly sure. link. That's fine. The Nancy's. Weebly link. Uh, we can have an updated we can make sure it's working on our web page. Uh, yeah. So what we will do is post it on our web page and make sure it's working. Uh, one more thing and then we'll move on. As part of the WIC curriculum, were the participants encouraged to grow gardens, buy farmers markets, organic food, and promote bread breastfeeding? Oh, great question. Because yes, one of the parts of our curriculum was breastfeeding. And our breastfeeding coordinator um, insisted we include that. And at first, I have to tell you, I was thinking, well, what, what's the connection? And then it made perfect sense to me. And yes, we uh, taught them about buying at farmer's markets. Um, unfortunately, farmer's markets sometimes are more expensive. We did talk to them about organic produce um, and um, uh, you know what the difference was with organic produce and regular produce. Um, and, and, so, and we did talk to them about gardens. Yeah, and, and I, I, those of you that are familiar with WIC know every summer there are a limited number of WIC vouchers for farmers markets. In our last round of classes in June and July of last year, 
we did uh, promote the WIC vouchers for farmers markets as part of our curriculum. So with that, I think we need to move along. Um, and we're gonna move to Judy Robinson. And the next two speakers have taken uh, Outside In Slow and they've modified it a bit for their communities. Judy Robinson is a principal planner and sustainability manager for Sacramento County. She's an executive committee member for the Capital Region Climate Readiness Collaborative and Design for Active Sacramento. She has over 25 years experience with local government, community planning and development. Judy is a recognized leader and expert on planning, climate, health, and the built environment, and currently has the best job in the world, connecting people, policies, and projects to build healthy and sustainable communities. And we're thrilled to have you, Judy. You're up. Good morning, or afternoon to those on the East Coast. Thank you, Kathleen, and everyone else for making this webinar series possible. It's really been excellent. And I'm honored to present with the panel today and share some of the work that we've been doing with the California Department of Public Health, our regional climate collaborative, and others. So yes, climate change may be hazardous to your health, but what's good for climate is also good for health. So how are we communicating this with little to no funding? I particularly like this uh, photo from uh, Disney movie WALL-E that shows human dystopia. The way that we plan and develop our communities impacts our health and is changing our climate. And until we point this out, people don't really realize it, and they're certainly not relating it to their own lives. There's a lot of good information and messaging already out in the world that we can use to inform the public and to make our point. We just need to reframe it a little. And believe it or not, people remember this slide and the message. Sadly, this is an environment that we are rapidly approaching. <clears throat> in fact, new human, uh, new autonomous aerial vehicles, AAV, are scheduled to be in flight in Dubai this summer. So while we laugh at human dystopia, we really aren't that far away from it being a reality. So with that said, how do we communicate messages around climate and health with little to no budget? <clears throat> and the things I'm going to share with you have been done just with my time um, and the time uh, with others. In Sacramento and our capital region, we've been successful through partnerships and collaboration. And truly, we need everyone from all sectors pushing the health implications of climate change because it's really too big for public health to do alone. Um, and this is a lesson that we learned through um, my work and the work of others on our cross-sector uh, team designed for Active Sacramento, where we brought together health, we brought together planning, we brought together transportation, private sector healthcare, uh, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, all these different sectors, so that we could really understand the nuances of what we do, how they impact health, and how we can um, frame things and reframe the work that we're doing so that people can understand how they can make changes that will influence people's health outcomes for the better. Um, in my introduction, you know, I, I am an executive committee member for the Capital Region Climate Readiness Collaborative, CRC for short, and this collaborative is one of six in the state. Uh, we're all under the umbrella of the Local Government Commission and a statewide collaborative called ARCA. ARCA is the, it's a, it stands for Alliance of Regional Collaboratives for Climate Adaptation, represents leading collaborative networks from across California that are building regional resilience to climate impacts, and this shows uh, six, there's another one that's forming in, in uh, the central uh, California area. Um, Monterey and, and some of the other counties down there. But our regional collaborative in total encompassed nearly 80% of the state's population. In fact, uh, we've got Michael McCormick from OPR who presented this first webinar as an ex-officio member giving us direct access to the state and the governor's office. So together, ARCA members work to enhance public health to protect natural systems, build economies, and create resilient livable communities throughout California. And ARCA members are able to effectively bolster our individual and collective efforts and in turn impacts. So take, you know, take a look at this. Please visit the ARCA website because <clears throat> there should be a collaborative, uh, a regional collaborative near you. So the CRC and, and other collaboratives, what, what do we do? Uh, we share information on, climate, on how climate change is changing. We find and share replicable adaptation measures and projects. We do education and training. 
uh, share new research and pilots that are underway, and connect members to climate experts or others that are working on similar projects so that we can leverage and grow resources for su successful outcomes. Climate and health are all part of this. Uh, the CRC has, is comprised of a lot of different climate experts from all different sectors. In fact, the technical assistance they provided to Sacramento County this past year on the local hazard mitigation plan really helped to um, inform that process. It added valuable information and resources to the final document that wouldn't otherwise be available. One of the uh, key initiatives that we have underway is actually her urban heat island effects. <clears throat> which I'll talk about uh, shortly. So here's uh, some of the logos of the, of the broad sector of, of, of our CRC members, in addition to cities and counties, universities, utilities, nonprofits, and uh, many private sectors. The diversity and the reach of these organizations significantly multiply our ability to inform these various sectors that can incorporate health and climate resiliency in their work and do a much broader and deeper reach into the community and it leverages resources. So, you know, imagine all of these folks taking the health message out to all of their connections and, and, and putting it in their language so that folks in their particular sectors can now understand it. Um, and so here's a great example. Our uh, local utility, SMUD, uh, is a key member of the collaborative. And here's a slide of a presentation their climate program manager made at a regional, regional convening of our public health officers, planners, and other health partners this past May on addressing health and climate. In fact, at this convening, we also had um, uh, a representative from uh, CDPH presenting on Brace and, and the outside in regional work that was going on. So here we have a utility provider talking about climate and then specifically talking about heat illness and death. And they provide electricity. And they're, they're taking the lead to reduce urban heat island effects across Sacramento and the region. They're using their resources to advance solutions such as green infrastructure and cool roofs. Um, and they're also helping to connect the dots on the health implications of uh, urban heat island, uh, heat illness, death, and these are new three partners using their investment um, and their resources to communicate messages uh, to their constituents. Um, and uh, thank you again to San Luis Obispo County for Outside In. Uh, CRC has also created um, Outside In Capital Region with the help of the State Department of, of, of Public Health. And I just want to say that when we first saw the Outside In SLO, um, our public health officer, Dr. Kasiri, here in Sacramento, saw this and she said, we need to do this. This is great information. And, and I agreed. Um, CDPH agreed to engage with us and, and work with us in, in developing fact sheets for Sacramento, and we cannot thank you enough. Um, initially, we were only going to do outside in for Sacramento, but it made sense in looking at the region and looking at the climate vulnerabilities. Most of the climate vulnerabilities um, across the region um, are the same. So that's when we decided to take the climate health fact sheets and instead of locating them on a specific public health website, to locate it on the, the collaborative website and, and create outside in capital region. Um, this way we could also leverage CRC to maintain the website information without placing added burden on each health department to manage. And it was also an easier way for health departments and others across the region to access and link to it. So here's a, a screenshot of the website of um, right now three of the fact sheets that are that are posted um, and, and available for, for folks to use. Here are three more uh, draft climate health fact sheets that are currently under review by CDPH. We went to our CRC region climate experts to weigh in on the most current and accurate information and resources in order to be able to include these on the fact sheets. Uh, we also wanted to do one fact sheet for each one of the climate hazards in the region. So all totaled, we did um, six. We did the original outside in SLO food and travel. And then we've also done fact sheets for heat, flood, which includes sea level rise, drought, wildfires, with, which also emphasizes air quality. Um, and We've got CRC members that, and other stakeholders that in the footnotes below, you can see that there's the, 
Climate Readiness Collaborative logo, the State Department of Public Health logo, and then for demonstration, we've got the Sacramento County seal in there, but any jurisdiction um, or other organizations, um, are there's space there for them to put their own um, logo in there and, and spread, it, uh, spread it throughout you know, all of their con contacts. And this was all free. I mean, it was, again, just people, people's time. Um, what was also critical was that the message be equitable and that it was going to be a good tool to inform our most vulnerable, vulnerable populations. So we went to our environmental justice community and, and uh, at the very beginning gave them the, the fact sheet, told them what we wanted to do and said, is this going to be a good tool to really um, reach those parts of our community? And they said, absolutely. Uh, they, uh, they felt that it was going to be a great way uh, to be able to communicate message and, very, and really important information. Um, SLO has done these in Spanish and CDPH is also translating these to Spanish as well. These fact sheets connect the dots in bringing together health, climate, and resiliency. We wanted people to understand that the climate is changing and that walking and biking and planting trees and growing your, all, and growing your own food all reduce greenhouse gases and also helps the environment. But while doing so, it's improving our health and keeping people healthier during, during extreme events. Uh, some other free services that are out there um, is Pixabay with three online photos. <clears throat> and sometimes getting the right photo to convey the message was, was challenging for us. But Pixabay um, was very, very helpful. We also went out and just shot some of our own photographs <clears throat> to cater to the specific message we were trying to make. Lastly, and in the spirit of, of leverage, use the work and initiative of others to spread your message. Currently, there's a national joint call to action occurring with nine national organizations from various non-health sectors. So um, American, Planning, Amer American Public Health Association is, of course, part of this, but so is Urban Land Institute, American Society of Landscape Architects, American Institute of Architects, the American Planning Association, American Society of Civil Engineers, National Recreation and Park Association, the U.S. Green Building Council, and many of these are also involved with the year of climate change and health. Each one of them have produced different documents for their sectors to talk to their audience and their members. And so as a health person, it's really helpful to use information from a developer or an engineer's own professional organization to communicate and engage with them. The document, Harvesting of the Value of Water, was done by Urban Land Institute and actually shows people by providing case studies of what healthy infrastructure is and looks like, it's and, and you know green infrastructure, but they see what it looks like. It helps them to understand, and then they can replicate it. Urban Land Institute, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, is an organization that represents land use and development disciplines, and it's one of the world's most respected sources of objective information on urban planning, growth, and development. In this document, they actually called out the environmental, physical, and mental health benefits, further connecting the dots on climate adaptation and health. So another added benefit to using another sector's resources, and it's presented in such a way as to relate to their audiences in their own language, so to speak. So it, it really helps to avoid losing messages in translation. And someone, speaking for myself, something someone coming from the planning side of things, you know, learning the whole health language, you know, was, uh, was, a, was a steep learning curve. Uh, but vice versa, I know, you know, health professionals are still trying to learn about transportation and land use. Um, so it's all very complicated, but where we can take this and then bring our expertise to, to added discussion um, is very helpful. Um, and as I just mentioned, sometimes we need to show people what it looks like to help them understand that Oftentimes, it's the nuances of a design um, that, that embeds health and climate resiliency in, in things that they're already doing, but they didn't even realize that it was already a huge co-benefit. And so these are before and after shots of a former blighted parking lot in New York City. As a result of these improvements, business increased 40% in the area following the improvements. So another argument where climate and, and, and health adaptation and um, and some of these infrastructure improvements can be and are good for business. But you take urban greening, placemaking, providing opportunities for social interactions, places where people can walk to and from, 
Um, these can happen almost anywhere. Um, these improvements are, are good for climate and they're, and they're definitely good for health. But it's about how we communicate the message and, and to not hesitate to get in front of different audiences and to, and to seek them out. Um, and the only cost is your time. If you're a health person, these other sectors will be very curious and interested about your message. In fact, this particular slide was one that I used when I gave a presentation on climate health a couple of months ago to our region's um, floodplain managers. And uh, they, they, they found it very, very interesting um, and informative. And, they, and there were quite a few aha moments of, oh, I get it now. This is what you mean. And we need to be creative in, in how we provide that to folks. So I think my biggest message here is it's about leveraging partnerships and to have others um, in your, your partnership and collaborative that will help spread the health message, put it in their own language, and, and help articulate how it can be implemented. And that we need to be thinking creatively and differently, not to think outside the box, but to think like there is no box. So thanks so much again. Very much, Judy. Uh, let's see if we've got a few questions for Judy. Uh, maybe go down to the bottom. Um, what were the sources again that were used to create the fact sheets, Judy? Um, well, some of it was just from some of the main uh, climate, uh, the, the state climate change websites for, um, okay, of course, now I'm blanking on them, um, that, that we use for a local hazard mitigation plan that's uh, available statewide. I apologize for, for blanking on the key climate resource that, that talks about climate change. Um, we went and, and looked more locally, however, on what resources were available in the region. And so we were directing people to say like the air district website uh, for more air quality information. We looked at websites that folks could be in different places of the region and then be able to access the link to where there's farmers markets um, in their community. And um, those links are actually embedded on the fact sheets. For, for folks to be able to, to access. Um, and so we essentially went to some of these, these, these various areas. We talked with um, you know, folks in, flood, uh, in our flood control areas and, and flood management to make sure that we got the, the correct flood alert website that would then direct people to how to get signed up for um, text notices or email notices if there was a, a flood coming in their area but then to pre that also connected them to resources on how to prepare for floods. Um, so each one of the different websites um, focuses in on more of those specific topic areas. We connected folks to Walk Sacramento, you know, in getting more involved with, with walking and, and uh, pedestrian improvements and, and getting involved with, with those processes. So that's just, those are kind of some of the examples, SMUD and PG&E uh, rebates for energy efficiency. So we connected them to those websites where they could, they could learn about some of the different rebates for energy efficiency improvements that, uh, that were openly available to folks. Thanks. Here's another question. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer it uh, succinctly because it's a tough one. What would be the strategy to recover public space from car enthusiasts? Recover public space. So I think what they want to do is give up the parking lots and uh, make them community spaces. How do you do that? Yeah, well, you know, um, everybody is fighting over those bike lanes and curb locations. We're, we're actually having those conversations now in Sacramento um, as part of our launch of um, being Electrify America's uh, first green city. And so while we're uh, advancing electric vehicle adoption and some curbside charging, we're having to balance that out with the interest of autonomous vehicles and drop off pickup locations on where does this thing, you know, kind of happen. But it's also being done in the context of we need to be providing 
fewer auto lanes and ensuring that we're retrofitting with sidewalks and bike lanes and, and advocating more um, uh, car share, transit use, and, and physical activity. So um, I, those, uh, in advocating, I mean, I, it's, I think there's going to be a lot of compromise because we're trying to do a whole lot of things in the same space, essentially. But there is some momentum about more efficiencies of how we're using the space and how do we share, up, share it with all of the different modes and then looking to the future on, on how things might, might be a little bit different. What's interesting about the autonomous vehicles is that um, the thought is that they're properly regulated and properly used. Those things are moving all the time, so you don't need parking lots anymore. So actually, a lot of those more spaces could, in fact, open up um, for as destinations, housing, you know, a better proximity to things. So, um, but it's 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 going to be um, a delicate balance, especially with uh, pedestrians, bikes, autonomous vehicles, kind of all of it. So stay tuned and and weigh into the conversation. More to come. Thank you. There, there's some really interesting questions there, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move to Darcy and then we'll come back to him and get them um, when we have time at the end. Um, and, and so our final speaker today is Darcy Pickens. Um, Darcy was actually the first person who contacted us after we did Outside In Slow uh, about uh, adapting it and using it in her county. And she was at the time with Kings County, a rural county, and She's going to talk about some of the challenges she experienced in implementing this. From June 2014 to June 2017, Darcy oversaw programming in climate change and health, healthy homes, and childhood injury prevention for the Kings County Health Department in California Central Valley. She also serves as the Environment Section Counselor for the American Public Health Association and sits on the Profession Promotion Committee for the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health. A certified health education specialist, she holds a Master of Public Health degree from San Jose State University. Darcy has a passion for, for prevention and through her work seeks to better understand the symbiotic relationship between population health and our environment. You're up, Darcy. Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you for um, to everyone in attendance. I'm so happy to be able to be here with you today and, and share some of what we learned on this journey, are still learning on this journey. Um, so as Kathleen mentioned, we um, I actually had to, had to go all the way to Chicago to learn about Outside and Slow and meet Kathleen, and I'm so glad I did. Um, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, we could do that in Kings County, no problem. You know, I think people would be open to it and um, and we could hit the ground running with this. Um, and I was wrong, <laughs> although we've been able to make some great progress. Um, so there was a lot of similarities in our approach and, and then a lot of differences. And we learned about those different differences um, predominantly through trial and error. Um, so I'm just gonna, gonna go through those for you today. So I know there's a lot of data on this slide, um, but I just kind of wanted to give you a quick comparison. So San Luis Obispo, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with California's geography, San Luis Obispo County is um, considered kind of central coast, and then Kings County is central valley. They're very close to each other. They're, they're pretty much neighbors. They're, they share a very small border, um, but they have very, very different populations um, and different geographies. So you can see um, population in slow is about twice what, well, in San Luis Obispo County is about twice what it is in Kings. Both counties rely heavily on agriculture, um, which I think is, is a key consideration in all of this. Um, Kings tends to have higher poverty rate, lower educational attainment. Um, we've got a lot more young people. We tend to have a very high birth rate here in Kings. Um, and we've got pretty poor out health outcomes. So if you look at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation health rankings there, um, you can see that Kings tends to, to rank pretty low um, on our health outcomes, health factors, including um, social and economic 
environment factors you can see there that San Luis Obispo County is five out of 57 counties ranks fifth out of 57 counties while we we rank 49th um so so we've got some big issues here this is not a race to the bottom okay i'm not showing you this to say you know look we win it's harder here uh it's just different right we are our population experiences a different reality on a day-to-day -day basis and so that's something to consider when looking at any program um, and particularly one that can be as polarizing as as climate change um, normally, I wouldn't include election results in a PowerPoint presentation, but I thought it was relevant here. Um, as most of you, I'm sure, know, California is a blue state, um, but a fairly high percentage of San Luis Obispo County residents voted for Trump, uh, and, a, and over half of Kings County residents voted for Trump. Um, and of course, this is a man who has publicly stated that climate change is a hoax. Um, and so, again, you know, I, I don't say this um, with the implication that it is necessarily good or bad, but that um, that is the reality for people here. Um, people here, Donald Trump's message really resonated with them. Um, and that came through loud and clear to me uh, as I was kind of in the middle of working on all of this. So just one more vis visualization of kind of where the two counties are. Um, you'll see, I'm not sure, can you guys see my, um, my mouse there? Hopefully, okay. Well, um, so like I said, San Luis Obispo, I think you, <laughs> you can. Um, so San Luis Obispo County uh, is right about here. Uh, Kings is over here. Then you have Fresno, San Francisco uh, further north. Um, San Luis Obispo tends to be um, very green. This is the Cal Enviro screen um, 3.0 score. So this is a mix of population burden, population characteristics, health and social indicators like education, linguistic is isolation, unemployment, um, and essentially kind of the lower score you have, the better you're doing. Um, and then in the bottom right hand corner there, you see Kings County, that little blue marker is our county seat. Um, Hanford, um, which is where I'm talking to you from today, um, and you can see that we pretty consistently, most of our census tracts fall within the 86th to 90th percentile on the Cal and Viro screen rankings. I encourage you to take a look at this tool, um, and, and if you're here in California, it has a lot of great information about um, specific geographies and some of the risks, uh, indicators, and outcomes in those in, in specific communities. It's been a great tool for us in this process um, and, and gives a really visual, um, puts a visual picture to, to some of this work and some of what we're facing. Okay, so um, challenges in rural communities. Some of these are challenges in every community, so that's just a caveat here, right? I, I fully understand that. Linguistic isolation is a big one for us. Um, we have a fairly high percentage of the population who is monolingual Spanish speaking. So not only do we need to tailor our messaging to be linguistically and culturally appropriate, but we have to consider that the sources of information and news might vary greatly for those that are monoling greatly from those that are monolingual English speakers, right? So um, as a monolingual English speaker myself, I tend to, you know, I have this frame of, okay, well, this is what the news is saying, and this is what I'm hearing on the radio and the TV and reading in the paper. And we had to take a step back and say, that's not what everybody's hearing and seeing. Um, so that was a really relevant one for, for us. Um, so both for putting information out and considering uh, what information was coming in to our population. Of course, geographic isolation is a big one and it's often coupled with linguistic isolation. Um, a lot of our monolingual Spanish speakers are in rural isolated portions of the county uh, where clinical public health and social services are already much more spare, sparse. Um, and of course, it adds to the vulnerability of communities in terms of emergency response, right, which is relevant to our work in climate and wanting to um, be able to act quickly to protect those vulnerable populations. And it also has an impact on community engagement in politics and program planning. Um, community engagement is often low in these communities in part because local government and um, programming in general is just not 
there, not present in the same way that it is in larger communities um, and, and population towns. Um, my internet connection is unstable. Um, and some of our more rural towns, there's a huge discrepancy in the uh, voter turnout, in um, program engagement. So that was a, a big consideration for us. Now, I know there's many counties that have an overabundance of acute health, social, and economic burdens. Um, that's nothing unique to rural counties. My, my view here is that when it's, it's already difficult for people to make the leap from what's in front of them to climate predictions, right, that tend to be based in the future. That's a difficult leap for many people to make, and I'm sure most people on this webinar are familiar with, with that concept and have, have seen it firsthand. But when you have a disproportionately high level of acute burden, so for us here, asthma, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, food insecurity, poor water quality. Kathleen mentioned earlier um, that some of the folks in her WIC program were saying their, um, their relatives lived here and didn't have access to clean drinking water. Well, that's, that's what we live with, right? It's a very acute burden that our population faces. So that makes it even more difficult to ask people to consider climate scenarios where all of those things are predicted to get a whole lot worse. That can be really overwhelming for the audience um, and, and can cause people to get defensive or shut down the conversation altogether. So we have to be really respectful of the fact that there are these acute burdens that need our attention and are um, no less important than the message we're trying to get across. That's part of the reason that the co-benefit messaging Kathleen referred to earlier really, really was key for us. Agriculture as a driving economic force. So again, this is true for San Luis Obispo too. They, they are an ag community um, in, in many ways. We tend to demonize agriculture when we talk about climate impacts. That's my perspective um, in the media, in academic circles, educational material meant for the public, data reports. We tend to um, talk about the tremendous burden the industry has on the environment, typically in a very negative light, with very little or no discussion around the fact that the public's food choices, land use planning decisions, and farm policy drive that industry. Now, I know that we're having some of those conversations uh, on webinars like this, but I don't think that that message is getting across in um, popular culture. I don't think it's getting across in mainstream media. Um, and so that has an impact in a community that is really driven by ag. Um, Milk in our community brought in $636 million last year. That is significant for us. Cattle and calves, $220 million. Um, ag is really the life force behind many of the Valley communities, and it's a source of pride for our residents. So when they see that industry demonized, they push back in a big way, and that's understandable. Um, and again, was, was a big part of what we had to consider in this process. The, the conversation around ag really needed to change. And then um, small, close-knit political and social networks. So this, is, this goes two ways. Many of these do, right? Um, it's a challenge, but it's also a tremendous benefit. It's a challenge in that people are very careful about what they say publicly. And it's easy for a person or a subject to become taboo or toxic um, and for that sentiment to, to spread quickly uh, and deeply. Uh, you also see people say things like, uh, well, you know, I, I, I agree with you, but, you know, I, I can't get behind what you're doing because it could hurt, you know, my brother, cousin, friend, whomever. Um, it could hurt their business or, you know, they've really come out against this. And so I, I can't say anything about climate change because that would look bad to, to um this this other person or sector and typically it's a person um, which I think can can be a difference between some of the larger communities and rural communities although I'm sure this happens everywhere um, the other side of that co coin of course is that if you're genuine and respectful about your aim to help the community doors can open really quickly in small communities so um, that's all I'm going to say about challenges. I wanna focus a little bit on solutions. 
and how we were able to embrace climate change as a public health issue. We're still in the process of that, mind you. Um, so gauging readiness. I um, mistakenly thought that we were much more ready than we are. And looking at this ladder of engagement, so there's, you know, various versions of this image in the right hand corner there. Um, but I, as a health educator, typically applied them to um, community community readiness uh, um, kind of on the ground, right? So Kathleen was talking about um, how people could take those daily actions, but they, they were ready to take the next step to the ladder. And um, we weren't really sure what that looked like initially. And, and so they've been working on that in flow. That's how I looked at this initially. What I found was that the ladder of engagement exists for, uh, for our leaders as well, our, our, um, our kind of our board of supervisors, for example. Um, and I had to approach them, engage their readiness in the same way, looking at what actions could they take that they were really comfortable with, how much could they commit to that was, um, for me, may look like a small bite, um, but for them was, was really a, a sign that they were on board with this work. We found that it was really important to um, have personal conversations. It became clear very quickly that a collaborative was not going to work in Kings. People were not ready for that. Um, it was not enough of a, climate change was not enough of a priority. And so it became about personal conversations. We framed a lot of these conversations as key informant interviews. That's how we prepared for them. That's how we treated them. But they were often coffee or lunch with a board member or the leader of an organization or um, the leader of a, a given community group. At first, um, you know, I took, I took the approach of let's train our staff, let's train all of our staff, and then that will kind of help us go down into ground level community members and work with them. For example, you know, approaching our WIC director and, the, and WIC staff, and then, um, and then working with the WIC clients. Well, what we found was that um, as we started to do those trainings, we got a lot of pushback. Um, people were not ready to hear our message the way that we were framing it. Um, we had assumed that they were at a certain level of readiness that they, they just weren't. And again, that was trial and error. We went in and, and said, let's talk about climate change and here's what it is and here's why it's a public health issue. And, and people were still seeing it, not everyone, but a lot of folks were still seeing it as something that they could, um, that they chose not to believe in um, and, and, the, and they didn't, that was it. They, they did not believe in it. There was no facts that you could throw at them that were going to convince them otherwise. Um, so the way that we talked about it had to change and how often we talked about it had to change. We, it had to be a fairly consistent message coming out of the health education unit in, in our health department. The same thing was true when I went to some of our existing collaboratives. Um, the room was often met with silence. Uh, um, and there were like a few people who would be willing to speak up, but there were a lot more who said, you know, this isn't a priority here. Uh, we have too many issues that we're facing right now. Um, so we really had to come with an open mind and be willing to change our message uh, to meet the needs of the folks that we we were trying to reach. Gauging readiness came right along with um, finding champions and being open to the fact that they might not be who you think. We wanted to approach community leaders and vocal public, public figures and, and we did that and we sat down and um, had coffee and lunch with those folks as I said. Um, but the aim of those talks was really to build a relationship and explore what common agendas um, might make this relationship work for, for both parties. Um, so that was our frame for community le leaders and local public, uh, vocal public figures. With our Board of Supervisors, for example, um, 
I talked a lot about wanting to put agriculture in a positive light. And um, while I, I wanted to remain honest about the fact that our food systems are damaging to our environment, I also wanted to um, be really respectful of how much the ag community brings to or the ag industry brings to our community and some of the efforts that are in place to protect the environment and and the food and the um, and the people um, and that message when you're sitting down having coffee with someone that message resonates with them a lot more easily than it does um, in a very public setting um, the gimmies, this was an interesting one. So these are people who um, who are are kind of already on board, right? They, they already share your message. Um, and I thought, well, this is great. We, we will have some of those people, not a lot here, but, but we'll have some. What I found was that I actually had to kind of reel these folks in and try to get them on board with, um, Try to get them on board with with finding a common agenda and hearing each other out sitting back and listening to the other side that's what we've spent a lot of our time doing is just listening um nevertheless these people are champions i actually they, one of my, the most inter interesting experiences with a with a gimme person um i was doing a presentation for our management staff at the health department and um a lot of them are farmers or have family members who are farmers and we were talking about food systems and um, personally I'm very passionate about food systems and and I um, eat and live in a way that that reflects wanting to protect the environment but I don't project that when I'm talking to this group of folks or at least I, I try not to I try to focus on on shared values um, and so I had a coworker kind of chime in and, and agree with what I was saying, but actually push it a little further. Um, and I had to, to try to reel him back and say, okay, but let's consider how the farmers are feeling and, and what they're already doing to try to make things better. Um, and I, and this person actually <laughs> went to a coworker and said, well, she must be a Trump supporter because she just did, didn't get it. And it was like, that's that's how this issue has become right very very polarizing so finding that middle ground based on a shared agenda and shared values has been tremendously important for us and so um, these people aren't really gimmies right they require attention and and support too just in a different way and then another really surprising what one um, the guy down the hall who brings us on lunch every day so I didn't realize the significance of this until I had a conversation with a Dorette English at CDPH one day um, I was feeling really frustrated and feeling like you know people weren't on board and and um, and then I started talking about you know well you know this person in our office has you know he's he's eating eating less meat and he's trying to bring his own lunch and and so I know he heard me um, and that's encouraging right and he's he's mentioned that to me um, another thing that started happening is you would I would get these emails from folks about uh, sending me climate articles and they would CC a couple other people who are in the meeting not everyone but just a couple people right and so you saw this little kind of underground swell of folks who wanted to champion the issue but didn't want to be up in front um, and I really wanted to be respectful of that um, give them a safe and encouraging space to talk about the issue and and encourage them to keep going uh, and keep being an advocate in in their own way I would have people come up to me and tell me almost in secret that they were going to a women's march or that they started composting and were learning about food waste uh, and they were talking to their friends about it too um, those are our champions. Those have been our champions here in Kings as we start this work. Those are the people that are going to carry it, carry it forward um, long after, you know, we come and go. Um, and the opponents that you build those relationships with, a lot of them were community leaders and public figures. Those opponents that you get to, um, for example, we had one of our board members uh, open up a door and, and let us sit down with the Farm Bureau. Um, they really have 
have your back um, in a way that someone who is already on board may or may not, right? They'll help you, the, the people who are already on board may, might help you spread your message, but, um, but when you can work with someone who was initially viewed as an opponent that can take you really far. I had to go up in front of our board of supervisors just to get our contract approved um, to go ahead with a outside in Kings um, or a Kings County climate assessment with a CDPH and I was grilled. I was grilled by our um, our county council. <laughs> I was grilled by um, some of the board members um, and but but I was comfortable up there because I knew that I had built those relationships that I had sat and, and talked to some of these folks one on one about my intentions and the department's intentions. And that was not to turn everyone into a, um, a you know, a, a liberal Democrat. It was to help our most vulnerable populations within the community that shared value spoke to our board um, and you know ultimately they they voted in favor of this which was a big step for them darcy this is kathleen i i think my boss did a much better job handling questions because we've run over a little bit are you almost done i am i'm sorry i know i'm i'm yes it's not your fault it's mine <laughs> Um, okay, so um, just briefly here, we have a couple more framing the issue, right? The way we talk about climate change affects the way people think about it. That's a given. Um, and but what I, I mentioned earlier is that you really can't approach people with facts. You have to approach them with um, with wanting to understand their lived experience and then find a way to relate this issue to that. Um, so this quote here from our WIC director, um, she doesn't even mention the word climate change, right? But she still has a message that's valuable and resonates with our folks. Um, we also found that looking at local data was really, really important, even more so than, um, than it might be in some other communities because um, we have some unique, every community, right, has some, some unique challenges. For example, we don't talk about um, sea level rise. <laughs> very much in our climate discussions because it's not relevant for folks here, even if it will ultimately have an impact on them, which it will, um, it's not relevant in their day to day. Um, and there's really an identity that goes with geography. And so we tried to be really cognizant of that. Um, and it also changed based on what they were seeing immediately. So in the summer, I'm talking about extreme heat. Uh, in the spring, I'm talking about air quality. In the winter, I'm talking about, you know, last year drought or year before last drought, last winter it was flooding, right? Um, and so our message is kind of constantly changing, although it's all, all aligned um, to reflect what people are seeing based on their immediate experience. And then lastly, framing solutions. Um, just like the co-benefit solutions that are presented in Outside In Kings, our broader solutions to addressing climate change through public health work, um, we found that focusing on mutual benefit and low risk was key. So we set out with specific goals, objectives, and intentions, and then we had to kind of throw them all out the window and see what was going to work um, based on where, where people were, um, at where the gatekeepers were. That was, that was who we had to get through first. Um, so small gains, um, looking for ways to make small gains in existing efforts. A couple examples there, we're working with our asthma coalition um, and they integrated emissions education into their strategic plan. Uh, we also are, we're revising our heat plan and public health will now be at the table at that, with that um, climate frame that they did not have before. So our staff has been, ha has been very early on one of our key audiences and we've realized that they must continue to be because um, hitting them, hitting that education once in a while was, was not working for us. And then looking for new programming that impacts climate but is not necessarily climate change centered. So our two examples here are food waste reduction program and health and all policies. Health and all policies is something that a lot of our staff and our management were on board with already and they were able, to, this was another reason for them to pursue that effort. Uh, and a food waste reduction program was something that our environmental health staff could really get on board with, um, even the ones who don't quote unquote, believe in climate change. They saw the value in food waste reduction. 
So um, that's it. Uh, I'm sorry for running way over here. Um, it's been a, a wonderful experience working on Outside in Kings and working with the California Department of Public Health on this issue. And, and I'm confident that um, that the work will continue. We're, we're seeing more of a groundswell. And so appreciate the small victories. Um, and this is my uh, email if you want to reach out for any questions. Thank you. And, and we will not have time for more questions. I hate to even look what's there because I'm sure they're really good questions, but we've run out of time. Again, my boss was much better handling the questions than I was. Um, one thing you should look out for, we're going to be sending an evaluation out to everyone. Please take a few minutes to fill it out. We'd love to hear what your experience has been, how we could do this better next time, what you liked about what we did. If you are one of those people asking for CEUs, if you're either a nurse or, or allied professional or a planner, you will absolutely need to fill out that evaluation in order to get your units. Um, and again, with that, we're going to uh, sign off. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to talking to you about this issue sometime in the future. Bye-bye.